Welcome back to the channel, ladies and gentlemen. Another day, another project. I guess I could consider myself lucky. This bike's still all together, not in a box, not in pieces. But it is, as most of them, locked up. I picked this bike up off the Face Space Marketplace, and right in the photos, they showed a whole list of engine work that was just done to it. But a bottom end was never done to it. If I put it in gear and I kind of roll it forward and back, it feels like it's trying to roll a little bit, but she will not move with the Kickstarter. So leaning towards probably a locked up crankshaft on this thing. But it's the same routine as always. I'm going to get the engine out of the frame, get it torn down, and get parts ordered for it. Because this one will be a fixer as well. This is a 2011 KX250F FI bike, fuel injected. And I'm excited to get it back on the track again. If you're interested in seeing that, stick around. Well, at this point here, there's not much difference between this and most of the other bikes. The teardown is pretty much the same. You've seen it on my other videos a thousand times. So I'm not going to bore you with the teardown on this. Not to mention the fact that I like to crank up my jams and that messes with my copyright infringement on the video. So I'll get this ripped out, get it on the bench, and we'll get back together when we start tearing it apart. I got her out on the bench, got all the fluids drained out of it, uh, the oil seemed to be full, a lot of fine metallic in the oil, so let's get it apart. Definitely going to repaint this valve cover, something that's not quite as limey, limey colored. Normally you'd want to put these on top dead center before you start pulling this apart, but you know, she's locked up, so we don't really have that luxury. Let's see if she'll turn it all. Yeah, she's turning. Something's jamming. <clears throat> wow, it's tight. Definitely got some metal in our screen. One thing that jumps out right away is this cam chain guide is not sitting in the seat where it belongs. Cam caps are in really good condition. Camshafts look great. Camshaft looks great. No issues yet on that stuff.
Well, I keep blaming these crankshafts, but it's not the crankshaft. And I'm going to have to take this head apart to see if it's going to be reusable. It's probably going to need some guides for sure. But let me check the seats out and see if they're in good shape. This chain doesn't look like it was ever replaced. Well, let me get the cylinder off and see if uh, this crankshaft's got any damage to it, but. The crank feels perfectly fine. I'm going to take the cylinder off. Let's take a look at the piston the connecting rod. Make sure all that stuff's good. The cylinder looks like it's in pretty good shape. It does have some wear scars. Like it's starting to break in. There are some scores, but I can't catch any fingernails on them. They're superficial. But we're going to measure up this cylinder. And the piston looks new. Although we're more than likely going to have to replace it again anyway. Well, unlike our last Yamaha project, this connecting rod is not twisted, bent, or damaged in any way. So that, as far as I'm going to go with this bottom end. No up and down play. So we got a good bottom end, we need to rebuild this top end again. Now the piston's not in terrible shape. It does have a little bit of superficial marking on it, which I think I should be able to clean up so we don't have any hot spots. So let's measure it and see if it's even going to be reusable. Alright, let's take a look at our piston diameter. We've got 3.028. Piston diameter 3.029 to 3.0299. So this piston is already too small. Needs to be replaced. The cylinder feels pretty good. I'm not measuring any taper or out of round. 3.030 so 3.035 is the service limit and this cylinder is within spec so we will lightly hone this again so we're absolutely going to need a piston and ring set now what it looks like is for whatever reason either the valve got stuck or whatever and it broke this upper retainer this head's really in good shape as far as the journals and everything else. So I really want to see if I can get this to clean up. Um, we'll probably replace all of the valve guides. As long as the seals aren't destroyed, we can probably scrape some of this valve junk off of here and polish this out.
The belt is definitely bent. Don't even need to spool that one up in the drill. This valve is stuck in here. I'm going to have to probably tap that one out. As you can probably see, the valve guide down inside there is broken. It's not uncommon when you have a failed valve. Well, let me see what I can do at cleaning this up. See if I can amaze myself. While it's not perfect, it probably could take it down and get it welded and then just refaced. It's not too bad. None of the seats have any damage to them, so we're in good shape there. I went ahead and knocked out both of the intake valve guides, and I'm probably going to do the exhaust as well just to be on the safe side. And we'll get all new valves, springs, keepers, the whole nine yards. All right, got a whole bunch of goodies. New oil filter. Timing chain, Pro X piston kit. Let's have a look at that real quick. Not quite as polished as some of them that I get. You can't see it inside the motor anyway. And we got a top end gasket kit. And we got new intake and exhaust valve kits, valves, springs, and top and bottom retainers. Did not come with the keepers though. I also got all new valve guides. I went with stock Kawasaki stuff. It's actually not too bad, like 18 bucks a piece or something like that. So they've all been knocked out. Now I've got our cylinder head all stripped down. Next step here, we're gonna take this up and go put it in the oven, about 300 degrees Fahrenheit. What that'll do is that'll expand this metal. We've already got our guides in the freezer, which will shrink them. So let's go do that. Typically what you want to do is put this in a cold oven, bring it up to temperature slowly along with the head rather than putting it in a hot oven. Reason being is we don't want to ha cause any warps to this head. Now while I'm waiting for my cylinder head to cook, I want to get everything prepped here because temperatures are going to start equalizing pretty quickly. So we want to get some boards that we can set our head on because we're going to have to do a little bit of beating. You'll need a valve guide driving tool and this basically will fit on your valve guide and you can hammer it into the head. We're gonna hammer it in from the bottom. You want some way to accurately measure the depth of these things. What I'm gonna use is my analog calipers and going off the spec from Kawasaki, I will set the depth of this pin to how deep that these need to be seated. And this way I can just tap them in, check them, tap them in and check them. Here are your specs for driving the valve guides. I've got my caliper set for 0 0.550 and locked down. So it's ready to go when we go to install these valve guides. I don't want to be fussing around with too much stuff because the temperature will equalize too quickly. All right, we got our hot head. I'm going to do the exhaust side first. What you're going to do is put your driver on. We're going to drive them in from the bottom. As we go, go, we're going to check our distance. And we got a ways to go yet. Now where you're measuring from is from the bottom of the cylinder head to the top of your guide. Perfect. One down, one to go. Great, now we'll get our intakes done. 
you know again for your intakes don't forget to change your measurement zero point six one zero Perfect. Now that we got our guides installed, we have to let this equalize, get back down to room temperature. Now at this point our guides are all in at the right depth, our cylinder is back to room temperature. Now at this point we just can't install our valves because they're just not going to fit. So these valves are 0.177 of an inch and my reamer is 0.178 of an inch. So we're going to ream these out and what I'm going to use is an electric drill. Now we certainly don't want to do any damage, so we're, we're going to take our time. As you can see, our valve is going in now. We will do the rest of it with the hone. Now on this head, since all four of our valves are the same size, I can use the same reamer. Now once they're all reamed to size, where the valves will go through, again they're still a little tight, which is perfectly fine. We will now hone them. We're going to use this little tiny ball hone and we'll run them back and forth a few times with our drill. The next thing I need to check to make sure that the valve seat is perpendicular to the valve guide that we just replaced. And replacing them and reaming them can definitely throw them off, in which case you will get a leak around your valves and you'd have to do a valve job. So before we go too far on this, I'm going to reset the valves and the springs in the head and we're going to test these to see if they're leaking. If they are leaking, obviously we're going to have to remedy that. All right, now that we got the valves installed, we're going to do a quick leak test. The easiest way to do this with the brake parts cleaner that works best, uh, or any kind of solvent. You can use water if you don't have that. We want to fill this combustion chamber. And it looks like the fluid level is dropping, so... I believe we are going to have a leak for sure. This thing is pouring solvent out of the intake valves. You don't see anything coming out of the exhaust valves. Now another thing we can do is while the solvent is in here we blow compressed air into the intake and exhaust uh, ports and look for bubbles around the valve. Now I'm going to try to demonstrate that but the solvent's leaking out pretty fast so I'm not sure if I'll be able to show you. I mean that's not even bubbles. That's just like that's not even bubbles, that's just pure not sealing. Okay, we got a little bit around the intake, a little bit around the exhaust. We're gonna have to redo our three-angle valve job. 
so head strip back down again you get a look at these seats we're going to recut all three of our valve angles back onto this so your three angles are going to be your 45 which is this angle on your valve right here this is the main sealing angle the other two angles are going to be approximately 60 degrees and 30 degrees that will vary slightly i'm talking about these uh, japanese racing bikes it is going to be your typical three angles well we can all 100 percent rest assured that i'm no artiste but this is going to give you a little bit of an idea of what's going on so this is your valve and this is a cross section of your seat so your valve face is 45 degrees so that's your main cut on your valve seat and it's the first cut you're going to make the other two cuts which is a 60 degree it's hard to see in the picture and again it's difficult to draw and then your 30 degree and then this is the head of the face of your cylinder head and when i drop these valves in i did a quick lap on them and you can see this dark ring on the ceiling surface and that ring is a little bit too far down on the valve it should be right in the middle but the width on it is pretty good however the valve is more than likely cocked just a little bit and it's minute but it's just not sealing so we're going to recut this at 45 and we'll recut the 60 and 30 to bring this in the center the reason they and again you could just do a 45 but what happens is with the 30 and the 60 it allows greater airflow around the valve less turbulence so that's why we cut all three angles and now this is just basically going to be a quick demonstration because most of you guys are not going to be able to do this at home the tool for this is uh, a new a new way or a new way valve seat cutting tool and it's extraordinarily expensive so what we got is our three cutters our 30 our 45 and our 60 and these things have carbide blades on them and we have a pilot that will drop down inside your valve guide and then this drops on here and these carbide cutters will actually cut this valve seat to a 45 where it needs to be but before we do that I need to get some machinist die on all these seats so I can see what I'm doing this is what we're using here die cam uh, blue layout fluid it has a little brush in the can this stuff is a mess so it will get everywhere but we just it doesn't really matter we just want to coat these seats real well so we can keep track of what we're doing and this washes right off with brake clean so don't worry about being messy with it now we just need to let that completely dry doesn't take long all right our layout fluid is dry and we'll make our first cut of our 45 on this seat so that goes right down inside of that guide it's super solid again like i said we're going to do our 45 first so we'll just make one light cut and kind of take a look at what our seat looks like So, <clears throat> right away, we just did a light cut, and I'm hoping that this crappy-ass camera will pick up the shiny part of this seat where it was cut. So, you can see it's shiny right here. That 45 looks really nice. Right here, it's not even touching. Same with right here. This is not even touching at all. So we need to get this so the entire valve seat is cut. And it's starting to get there along this backside. Not yet. Now, as you can see, our seat is cut all the way around our 45 degree angle and it's thinner in some spots and thicker in some spots, but that's not a problem. The manufacturer recommends a thickness of that 45 degree 
angle. Now, every manufacturer is going to have their own specs on this thing, but I mean a good general rule of thumb. And Kawasaki here is saying for the intake and exhaust, they're looking for two one hundredths to four one hundredths of an inch thick of the valve seat. Now we definitely have that. It could actually go a little bit more. You don't want to go too much because what happens is the valve starts sitting deeper and deeper in the head, and then you won't be able to shim it any any longer. Um, in which case you'd have to replace the head or send it out and have the seats replaced. Uh, I certainly don't have any, any ways to replace these seats at home and I have absolutely no ambition to get anything to do that. So I just want to avoid that altogether. So I think I'm going to make a little bit more of a cut, make this just a tick wider, and then I'm going to put some non-drying layout fluid in here and get a pattern on my valve. All right, this is the nasty stuff right here. This stuff gets all over everything. It's like an ink, and it does not dry. All right, so the purpose of what we're doing here is we're going to see where this contact surface is in relationship to the valve face. So ideally what I'm looking to do is drop this valve down inside the head and tap it without turning it to see where our contact patch is going to be. If it's going to be too high or too low, that's going to tell me where to make my 30 and 60 degree cuts. So as you can see right here, the valve seat is very wide. Right here it looks pretty good. Here I'm just not making really good contact, but what I need to do is tap this thing with a little bit of a 30 which is going to be this bigger angle on the end and bring that line this way just a touch. I'm just going to go ahead and check all of them while I'm here. Same thing here. The seat width is too wide. We're going to make a 60 and a 30 degree cut very lightly and that will thin that line up. Well, they said this stuff won't dry up, but it's drying up a little bit. Yeah, same thing here. In fact, I don't think I really even need to cut the 60 on this one. We just need to cut the 30 to bring this line down just a little bit. It's crazy, it is drying up just a little bit. It is a balmy 52 degrees in here. And the same with this one. I'll do a light, light 60 degree pass on the inside. And then we'll just hit it pretty good with the 30. Now the 60 is a very aggressive cut. you got to go real easy. The 30 is going to be a little bit more difficult. So I can put a little more pressure on it. And we'll squeeze that up. Got a good cut all the way around. We'll go ahead and hit the rest of them. The key is taking off the minimal amount of material necessary. There's our 60s. Go ahead and cut our 30s. Now you may have to do this a few times. You can see the dark line is going to be your 45 degree valve contact area, and that should be even all the way around. And now basically, what we're going to do is just do the same thing with the grease, the greasy dye and make sure that we're lined up properly on our valve if we are our three angle valve job is complete next thing i'm going to do is relap my valves in it's a fine abrasive and this will ensure that we have a good seal and our contact patch is beautiful all the way around. Like I said, I wish it could be just a little bit higher. 
but I don't want to continue to cut these seats. This will work just fine. Now that you got all your valves lapped in, it's imperative to take this over to your parts washer or your kitchen sink or your hose outside and get all of this grit out of here. This will absolutely destroy your top end if you allow it to get down inside of there. We're going to clean our head, clean our valves really well. Again, maintain the orientation in which you lap them in. Now I got my valves all back in. We're going to redo this leak test. Well, that's certainly looking much better. Also gonna look up inside my ports to make sure I don't see anything dripping down. We look real good on the intake side. And we're looking real good on the exhaust side as well. Now, if you have your original shims and original buckets and in the original locations, put all that stuff back together. Putting our shims back in is gonna give us a baseline or somewhere to start with, whether we need to go bigger or smaller. All right, once we get our tappets all back in, we can set our camshafts in. And what we're looking for is to set our timing marks properly. And with these Kawasaki's here on our intake cam, you have two marks and they're going to be perpendicular or 90 degrees from each other. What we're looking for is the mark to the right to line right up with the cylinder head. And what you should see is your cam lobes pointing up and away at approximately a 30 35 degree angle now what happens with these camshafts sometimes and it will drive people absolutely crazy is this front gear is just pressed onto the camshaft and they spin sometimes they'll actually spin on here and you'll have your timing marks perfect but can't get this bike to start it's popping backfire and won't start at all well, if you look at your camshaft and those marks are lined up, and let's say your intake cam lobes are off like this or way down like this, then you know your front gear has spun, in which case you're going to need to replace the camshaft. But if you put them lined up with the head and they look like that, you're in good shape. Same thing goes with your exhaust cam. Your mark to the left will point and line up with the head your other mark will point straight up and if you can see that your marks are lined up and our cam lobes are exactly the same as the intake just pointing in the opposite direction so we know these have not spun our next step is going to be put our cam cap on and get it torqued down as of this moment we're not really worried about our o-ring in here this is going to be on and off and on and off a number of times Now Kawasaki marks their cam caps with a tightening sequence, which is fantastic. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. All of the bolts that go in here are black except for one. Silver bolt is going to go in slot number five. The torque on your cam caps, camshaft cap bolts, is 87 inch pounds, 9.8 newton meters. All right, we got them all torqued down. And I'm already noticing an issue here. I cannot turn this intake camshaft at all. It's tight. So we got one of two problems. Either our camshaft is binding in the journal here, which we're gonna have to address, or more than likely our shims are too thick and the camshaft is dragging on the tappet so what we're going to do is go ahead and get measurements on this stuff and see if we can get a, a feeler gauge even in there. So what we're looking for in the exhaust clearance is going to be 0.17 to 0.22 millimeter. We'll start there. I don't have a 0.17, so we'll go 0.18. And we're looking to measure in between the cam lobe and the tappet. And this should go in with just a slight drag.
and they're feeling like they're going in super easy. So I'm going to go to the top end of the range, 0.22 millimeter, which also I don't have. We'll go with a 0.23, and I would expect this to not go in. And it does go in on both of them very easily. So our gap on our exhaust cam is too big. So now what I need to do is find exactly what the gap is. And I'll just go incrementally, 0.25 millimeter, until it, they will not go. And as we get our measurements, we'll write them down. So here we're at 0 0.28. Here we got 0 0.43, which is huge. Another thing you want to keep in mind is you want to try to keep the camshafts from rotating while you're doing this. Now on our intake, we're at 0.10 to 0.15. Again, we're going to start with the 0 0.10, and I have a feeling it's not even going to go in. So that one's not going in at all. And neither is that one. So unfortunately, this is going to be a little bit of a trial and error because they're too tight already. I'm going to have to go down one shim at a time until I find the proper combination that I need. Now as far as the exhaust, 0 0.43, 0 0.28, we need to get them into this range. So we need to add thickness to these shims, which will drop our clearance level between our camshaft and our tappets. Now obviously this one's going to need quite a large amount of shim. This one, probably one size shim, will, will bring me into spec on this one. In your owner's manual, there will be conversion charts you can do mathematicals and stuff to figure it out now when it comes to the intake camshaft we're going to have to take shim out we're going to have to use thinner shims to bring the tappet further away from the camshaft adding shims to the exhaust removing shim thickness from the intake now on our Kawasaki here, we use a 7.48 millimeter shim, and that is the diameter of our shim. And a lot of times the shims will have markings on them, and I'm not sure if you can see that. It says 2.80. So like I said, we need a thicker shim. We're going to go 2.85, which is one size shim larger. If you're not sure, a lot of times these things, the markings have worn off of them. You'll have to measure them. So just to recap, after all is said and done, your clearances between your journals and your tappets should be within spec on your exhaust side and on your intake side, and both camshafts should spin freely. At this point here, I'll just finish putting a couple of the pieces back on the cylinder head, and now we're going to move on to our cylinder and piston. What we're going to do is I'm going to throw a light hone into the cylinder just to restore that cross hatch pattern. Although it's in really good shape for the most part. We'll just touch it up just a little bit. And then we're going to get our rings in the cylinder and make sure that our end gaps are within spec. Very important. Now I just got to use my cylinder brush over in the parts washer and get all of this cleaned up. This freshly honed surface will give the new rings something to seat into and these tiny little scratches will hold oil in them to help lubricate this top end while it breaks in. Now this particular piston has an oil control ring and one compression ring. Normally these oil control rings, in fact I've never had one that has been out of spec as far as being too tight in the cylinder. I have however had issues with the compression ring being too tight. Now on your compression ring, 
there is a mark right here. It says R. I think it says R. That's going to be the top. Whenever you get a mark on your piston ring, that's going to mean that's the top. In other words, facing up, not top ring necessarily, but facing up. We want to get this in our cylinder below the ring ridge on the top here. And we'll square it up with our piston. And we want to take a measurement on that gap to make sure that it's within spec and it's not going to be too tight or too loose. Obviously, new ring, not worried about too loose. We are worried about too tight. Reason being is, like we talked about earlier with the cylinder head, when you heat things, they expand. So when you heat that ring, it's going to want to expand and it will tighten that gap up. And when this engine's whipping and that gap tightens up and closes up, good chance you'll have damage to your piston cylinder or ring itself. What we're looking for is 0.15 to 0.25 millimeter. And again, I said I'm not too worried about the top end, so we're just going to make sure the 0.15 goes in. If it does, we are in good shape. And it absolutely goes in there just fine. So I don't have to do any modifications to this ring. And I'm going to check my two oil control rings just to be on the safe side. And the spec on those is 0.20 to 0.70. So very, very open gap on those. Now that our ring end gaps are sorted, we're going to go ahead and get them installed on the piston. Now you want to follow your manufacturer's recommendation of the piston or at a minimum the OEM specifications as to where the gaps are going to go. Now the reason we're following ring gap placement is important is if ring gaps are lined up, you could potentially have a smoking issue while it's running or compression loss. In this particular case, I wouldn't worry about compression loss too much since you only have one compression ring. Orientation of the piston is critical. Normally, there's going to be a mark towards the front of the piston, and that's going to point towards the exhaust. However, on this Pro-X, there is a mark down here on the bottom. But just looking at the piston, you can see that these reliefs are a lot larger than these. And these are going to be your exhaust valves, and these are going to be your intake valves. So use that as your guide when installing a piston like this, the proper orientation. If you end up mounting it backwards, you're going to do valve and engine damage. Once you get your ring set in your piston, you're going to install one of the circlips. And the way I do this is I go ahead and put this piston in the cylinder now and then slide the cylinder onto the engine. It's just a lot easier. Now we want to maintain our orientation 100%, which direction is exhaust and which direction is intake. This is our exhaust side. This is our intake side. We want to follow this. So when we rotate this upside down, we're going to rotate this upside down as well. Get a little bit of oil in our cylinder. As you can see, the bottom of the cylinder has this little bit of a chamfer, which makes it easier to get your piston rings in and started without any special tools. Just want to be extremely careful we don't catch any of the end gaps, especially these oil control rings. They're very small. They don't get caught and pushed out. Sometimes that can go unnoticed. It's obviously a lot easier to do this on the bench than try to do this while... The piston is attached to the connecting rod and the cylinder is moving and the connecting rod is moving. At least here you have a little bit more control. And we just want that in partially so we can drop this right onto our connecting rod. And before I go any further on this bottom end, I want to get this oil filter out and make sure that there's nothing big chunks in there and make sure all our oil passages are clear into the cylinder area. Make sure that it's getting oil up into the cylinder. There's definitely a little bit of fine metal in there. Not crazy.
I'm blowing a little oil in the center hole to make sure that I've got a clear passage up to my cylinder head. And there's also a port inside here that will blow oil up onto the cylinder skirt and lubricate the bottom of the piston. And all of that is clear. This is where it makes this easier. We'll just align this with our connecting rod. And push our pin through. Now all we have to do is get our snap ring on. To do that, we're going to put a rag over our crankcase to make sure that if that circlip drops, it doesn't go down inside the case. Once you finish struggling with these pain in the ass clips, just make sure it's 100% in the groove. Good, no binding. So if you remember when we took this guide out, somebody had put it in like that. And that's supposed to sit down inside of this little cradle. I'm going to go ahead and throw an old zippy on this chain. Helps me keep a little bit more control of it. dropping in your cylinder head bolts a little bit of engine oil on the threads and on the washers these larger head bolts are to be torqued down to 36 foot pounds I generally like to do it in three stages so I'll do like 15 25 36 and we're gonna do it in a cross pattern that just helps to try to alleviate any kind of warp Now it's time to get our cams in and timed up. Now we left this piston on top dead center. Top dead center is when the piston is at the top of its most travel and it has not moved on these Kawasaki's and a lot of them. If you look at the Woodruff key on your crankshaft when you're on top dead center that will point directly up the engine. Another way to tell is to stick a screwdriver down inside of the cylinder hole, spark plug hole and when you rotate the engine back and forth you can see it going up and down you want to get it right when it's at its topmost travel and it has a certain feeling to it it feels like it's dragging going up dragging going down but when it's at the top dead center it's very very loose feeling it's just something you get to feel after a while that's going to be crucial for getting our camshaft timing correct we're going to start with our exhaust cam and the reason for that is the front part of the chain we want no slack in it so we want to install this without turning the crankshaft because like I said it will turn really easily just be cautious of that and we talked about the timing marks earlier we want the left mark lining up with the cylinder head the top mark pointing straight up as you can see we got our mark lined right up with the head top marks pointing straight up no slack in the front so if we turn it backwards, you can see the slack. We don't want any slack in it. Again, make sure your crankshaft didn't move. Next, we're gonna go over to the intake. 
Same thing on our intake. We have our two marks. One is going to point towards the cylinder head. One is going to point straight up. Obviously, this is much easier when it's not in the bike. But this takes a little finagling to get in sometimes and get lined up correctly. And I just happened to hit it first time. Mark lined up with the head. Mark lined up with the head. Looking at your camshaft lobes, they're pointing up and away the proper direction. If you look at them, they're almost flat across the top. And that's going to be your perfect angle. At this point here, we'll get our cam cap back on. Don't forget your retainers or locator rings. And now this is where your O-rings are going to come and play. The reason for the O-rings is it keeps oil from the cylinder head going down into the spark plug hole. Now if your bike has this little weep hole in the side of the cylinder and you see oil dripping out of there, that's because the oil is getting past these O-rings. The O-rings are no good or not even in there. The last guy who built it didn't put them in. Also, if you get any water down your spark plug hole, that's a drain for that as well. The smaller one goes on the bottom. The bigger one is going to go on the top. Now, following your tightening sequence, torque your cam cap back down. Again, once they're tightened down, make sure that they both spin freely. And at this point, you can remove your zip tie. Let me go ahead and get my tensioner back in. And on these Kawasaki's, you take the back cap off. Sometimes there's a pin, sometimes there isn't, and a spring. And then once you do that, you can push on this little presser, this little ratcheting mechanism, and push this back in. Once you got that done, re-verify that you're still on top dead center and that your timing marks are lined up. And what I like to do now is do a couple of full rotations of the engine, make sure nothing's binding. Now you can bring it back to top dead center. And as you'll notice, our timing marks are way off. Well, there's two top dead centers because it is a four stroke. So if your timing marks don't line up, go one more full revolution. Top dead center, lined up. You can put the rest of this engine back together. Now while the valve cover that I neglected to paint days ago dries, I'm going to go ahead and put this built engine back in the frame. Nothing special to it, so I'll catch you when it's all back together. What I'm doing here is just running the motor forward a little bit after I filled it with oil just to make sure that I'm getting oil up here to my journals so I don't have a dry start. Well, unfortunately, we had to put our KX project on the back burner for a little while. I had a couple other things I had to take care of, but I got it all together now. Got some oil in the crankcase, a little bit of coolant in the rad, non-ethanol in the tank. I'm going to give this thing a couple kicks and see if she pops off. And as always, fingers crossed with these things, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? and it sounds pretty good idles very low but that's something we can definitely remedy well she definitely runs and she sounds good there's an issue with this throttle body. I never heard it run before, so I'm probably going to have to delve into this thing just a little bit more and find out why she doesn't really want to idle. So our Kawasaki project runs. It does not start easily, and it will not idle. And it, it feels like it's running lean. It's got a hanging idle, and then it will drop down and shut off like a pilot circuit issue in a carburetor. Now, 2011 was the first year of the DFI for the KX250F. Kawasaki started it in 2009 with their 450. And it's a decent system, real snappy and everything. I have a feeling they had issues with the 250 because in 2012 they ended up putting two injectors. They put a second injector 
in the air box itself for wide open throttle it's something to do with the airflow through the box so what i need to do now obviously is find out why this thing will not idle and first of all we're going to look for simple things like uh, air leaks around the intake boot the intake air pressure sensor or map sensor there's a hose that goes to the manifold um, a lot of times those rot or fall off and that will cause issues as well so we're going to check those things first if not we got to pull the old multimeter out and start testing everything from the throttle position sensor to the coolant temperature sensor to the intake air temperature sensor obviously some of the first things you want to check is make sure all your connections are good you don't have any corrosion permatex dielectric tune-up grease is a good thing to put on all your connectors it will keep water and dirt out Here's our map sensor here on top. And this thing, this connector is full of dirt. Now off the bottom of this sensor is a rubber hose. And this goes down to your throttle body. Sometimes you'll find this hose gets knocked off or it's got some dry rot to it. And if it doesn't get the proper signal from the manifold and it can't do its adjustment properly. So we're going to pull this hose off and take a close look at it. I got my fuel pressure gauge tied in. Let's see if we can get a look at what we're looking at here for fuel pressure. And we got about 43, which is perfect. Our right, next thing we're going to check is our throttle body to see if we have any air leaks. The way I'm going to do this is a, a smoke machine. It's a leak detector. As I think I purchased this thing on the jungle website. It was less than a hundred bucks and it's totally worth it for finding stuff like this How this works is you hook it up to 12 volts and through your shop air and it produces a smoke Under very light pressure. I think it's one, one psi or something like that The smoke rate is adjustable. So first thing I want to do is get this engine back up on our top dead center Now with the engine on top dead center, intake exhaust valves are all closed. Combustion chamber is sealed off from the intake. So this entire unit here should be airtight. So what I'll use is this little plastic block off here. We can stick our hose and we'll start increasing the air pressure and the smoke. Let's see if we got any smoke coming out anywhere on the throttle body. Now we did have a little bit of air coming out around our idle adjust screw, our enrichment circuit. This should not cause the problem that we're having. What I'm mainly concerned with is the intake boot and making sure all that stuff is sealed. Now if the bike's running, another way to test this is propane or map gas. Just lightly going around and see if you can hear the idle change. Um, also using any kind of solvent like a brake clean, a carburetor cleaner and spraying that around. If you find a spot where it's sucking air in, it's going to change your idle. And that's a place that you can look into a little bit more. I'm not coming up with any kind of air leaks on this whatsoever. But I'm going to go ahead and pull this throttle body off and just look over it on the bench. Again, I don't know the history with this bike too, too much. Whether it was running well or not running well. So I might as well just check it out for myself so I know. I got her on the bench here and disassembled. It's not terrible. It's pretty dirty, so we'll go ahead and clean that up. Next, I'm going to do a quick resistance test on our gear position sensor, which is located right here. Neutral. First. Second. Third, fourth, and fifth. The resistance is off by a few ohms. It might be just dirty connection. Yeah, it looks better when we go in. So this position sensor is absolutely fine. This not causing our issue. Quickly off camera, I resistance tested our 
temperature sensor and our intake air temperature sensor. And the way we test it on this one here is Kawasaki wants you to put the tip of the sensor and 104 degree oil or water or whatever it might be and then you're going to get your measurement and both of them fell right in where it needed to be so those are not our issue as you see we took the throttle body apart i cleaned the injector real well no issues with that working perfectly we know we don't have a fuel pressure issue we know our capacitor is good we know our stator is good the there's two sensors that i cannot test with a resistance test as is and that's going to be the throttle position sensor in the uh, map sensor or the intake air pressure sensor what we need to do to test that is we have to hook a battery we'll remove our condenser or capacitor and we hook a 12 volt battery up to that and then they want us to take some input and output voltage tests and generally it requires a special harness adapter to get that to work you can get in there and test it by puncturing through the insulation and then just sealing that back up which is the way i'm going to have to go but i started thinking about this and just like if you were working on your car or anything like that and the dome light wasn't working you don't start ripping into the wiring the first thing you do is check the fuse well in this case here before i go into ripping into any more testing on this here i went ahead and just Took a quick look around the old interwebs, check the forums and stuff like that. And what I'm hearing about these 2011s or, or the general consensus is that they are very, very cold blooded and they do not like to idle until they're fully warmed up. So I feel like I didn't give this bike a good shot or a good chance. I started up, turned the enrichment circuit off and she doesn't want to idle and die. So I think what I'm going to do is warm this bike up and see if she'll idle after that I mean that makes sense All right, so our idle is still no good. It's time now we're going to start checking some of these sensors. So to test everything, we need to power up the system with 12 volts. The way we do that is we disconnect our condenser. And we're going to plug 12 volts directly into that. I made this harness up real quick, but you can purchase this through Kawasaki. And it's like 20 bucks or something like that for that harness if you, if you, if you don't want to make it up. So Kawasaki has an adapter that goes in between here um, that helps to be able to test these wires without puncturing the insulation. I don't have it. I'm not purchasing it. So we're just going to puncture the insulation. The sensor connected. Turn on your battery. What we're going to check is your input and your output voltage. Engine off. Now, if you notice uh, to the connector here, and this is on a 2011, I don't know if it's different between 2012 or, or beyond, but you have a blue, a gray, and a red. The red is, we're going to put our positive lead on the red and our negative lead on the gray. And what we're looking for on our tester is somewhere between 4.75 to 5.25 volts. Anywhere in that position, we're in good shape. So we have 5.01 volts, falls right into where we need to be. And again, engine off, we want to check the, the sensor's output voltage. Same thing, black's going to go to the gray, except we're going to put our red to the blue. And our reading that we're looking for now is going to be between 3.8 volts and 4.2 volts. I'm getting 3.86 volts. So the resistance measurements at standard atmospheric pressure are perfect. They're right where they need to be. Next, what they want you to do is change the atmospheric pressure by putting a vacuum on this line and making sure that the readings follow. Unfortunately, I don't have the tools to check that, so I'm not going to be able to go any further on this sensor, but I'm going to assume it's okay. Next, we'll check this throttle position sensor, and we check it much in the same way. In fact, our colors are, are similar. Our red is going to be our positive lead. Our gray is going to be our black lead, and we're going to get an input and an output voltage. The voltage should be the same, right around 5 volts, 475 to 525 on the voltage. 
with power applied. So we get the same thing, 5.01 volts. Uh, check the output voltage. Uh, gray is still going to be our negative lead, and now we're going to go to yellow with green for our positive lead. We're going to be looking for about 0.6 volts. So we are out of range. I am going to turn that up until it says 0.6. Now this is not the issue. I fooled around with this just a tick. So 0.62, close enough. And we'll snug that up. I'm gonna recheck it and we'll also blip the throttle. And wide open throttle, we should be at 3.63 to 3.83. I wanna make sure they block this so y'all can't see it. That's the main goal here. All right, that throttle position sensor is good. Well, it's safe to say that at this point here, I'm a little bit frustrated. Everything I tested is turning out to be A-OK, -okay, which is usually a good thing, but I still have an idle issue. And to be quite honest, I'm kind of done with it for right now. I'll reach out to the community. If anyone out there has one of these or has had one of these 2011s and had this kind of an issue and you're able to fix it, um, throw something down in the comments. Let me know what you came up with. I got to kind of put this on the back burner again. I got other projects going. I hate to leave you all hanging on this. And it's a shame because this bike, I took it out and rode it around and this thing runs unbelievable. It just won't idle. I went ahead and tested the whole intake system with map gas no change in idle whatsoever it just won't idle it hangs and then it will drop like it's too low and shut off i can turn this way up and it'll just rev way out and i know the the rpms on these things are supposed to be right around 2000 which is a little bit high for these bikes but this thing's running a lot higher than that probably about 25 and i can't drop it any lower than that or it will stall kawasaki sometimes are a real you know what i'm saying so anyway Thanks for hanging with me for this entire video. I certainly appreciate it. We will revisit this in the future once I get my wits about me. As always, I want, I want to thank you all for watching. I totally appreciate it. I love watching my subscriber count go up. Also love all your comments, likes, and shares. So keep it up. Definitely appreciate it. And we'll see you on the next one.